Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. John Winthrop delivered a sermon before he led the first large wave of colonists across the Atlantic Ocean from England in 1630. The sermon is famous largely for its use of the phrase, a city on a hill, used to describe the expectation that the Massachusetts Bay Colony would shine like an example to the world. Let's listen to the most celebrated part of that famous speech with the help of the Revived Thoughts podcast. We are to seek out a place of cohabitation and fellowship under a due form of government, both civil and ecclesiastical. There are two rules which we are to walk in together, justice and mercy. These are always separated in their actions and in their motivation. Yet, they may both agree in the same way at times, for sometimes there may be an opportunity of showing mercy to a rich man in some sudden danger or distress, and also of doing justice to a poor man in regard to some particular rule or law. There is a time when a Christian must sell all and give to the poor, as they did in the apostles' times. There is a time also when Christians, though they have not given all yet, must give beyond their ability. Likewise, in moments of crisis in the community, they may be called for extraordinary generosity. When there is no other way by which our Christian brother may be relieved in his distress, we must help him beyond our ability rather than tempt God by requiring him to intervene by miraculous or extraordinary means. This duty of mercy can be lived out in a few practices, giving, lending, and forgiving of debt. But there is a question. What rule should a man follow in giving respect to how much? The answer, if the time and days are ordinary, then he is to give out of his abundance. Let him lay aside just as God has blessed him. If the time and days are special, he must be ruled by them, knowing that a man cannot likely do too much if he puts himself and his family under a situation where they lack a comfortable subsistence. A man must lay up for his children and posterity. Fathers lay up for their future and their children, and he is worse than an infidel that doesn't provide for his own. In another place, the apostle speaks against those who walk in excess. And it is without question that he is worse than an infidel who, through his own laziness and pleasure-seeking, will neglect to provide for his family. He that gives to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him even in his life a hundredfold to him or his. The righteous is ever merciful and lends, and his seed enjoys the blessing. And besides, we know what advantage it will be to us in the day we must give account when many such witnesses will stand up for us to witness to the good use of our talents. And I know of those who fight against the idea of laying up for the time to come. If they do acknowledge it, how much do they let it affect them? Which brings us to this conclusion. If your brother is in need and you can help him, you do not need to doubt what you should do. If you love God, you must help him. All men are to be generous and cheerful while practicing and believing in sweeter promises. If you pour out your soul to the hungry, then will your light spring out in darkness, and the Lord will guide you continually and he will satisfy your soul in the drought and make your bones fat. You will be like a watered garden. On the contrary, the most heavy of curses are saved for those who did not help God's people. We are a company professing ourselves fellow members of Christ, though we may be absent from each other by many miles, and our work may bring us far from each other. Yet we should still hold ourselves knit together by this bond of love and live in the practice of it. Otherwise, how will we feel the comfort and presence of Christ? We are to seek out a place of cohabitation and fellowship under a due form of government, both civil and ecclesiastical. In such cases as this, the care of this public must hold sway over all private respects. 
By this, not only conscience, but civil policy will bind us together. For it is a true rule that no one can survive the ruin of society. We must do the work of setting up a new colony and the goal of preserving and building up Christ's church. Therefore, we must not content ourselves with the usual and ordinary ways of doing things. Whatever things we did or should have done while we lived in England, the same things we must do, but even more so, where we are going. We must do what is expected of a church and then make so much more our daily habit. For example, in this duty of love, we must love brotherly without any pretenses. We must love one another with a pure heart passionately. We must bear one another's burdens. We must not look only on our own things, but also on the things of our brothers. And we must not think that the Lord will bear with our failures as he does from those whom we are leaving. So stands the cause between God and us. We are entered into a covenant with him for this work. We have taken out a commission. The Lord has given us leave to draw our own rules. We have professed to go out for these good reasons. We have sought his favor and blessing. Now, if the Lord is pleased to hear us and bring us in peace to the place we desire, then has he ratified this covenant and sealed our commission. He will expect a strict performance of the rules we have set out. But if we neglect the observation of these rules which are for the goals we have proposed, then we break fellowship with our God. If we fall and embrace this present world and do not crucify our carnal intentions, instead of seeking great things for ourselves and our posterity in God, then the Lord will surely break out in wrath against us. He will be rid of such a people. He will make us know the price of breaking his covenant. Now, the only way to avoid this shipwreck and to provide for our posterity is to follow the counsel of Micah. That is to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. For this end, we must be united in this work, as if we were one man. We must entertain each other in brotherly affection. We must be willing to forget our desires for the supply of others' necessities. We must conduct business together in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and generosity. We must delight in each other, make others' conditions our own. We should rejoice together, mourn together, labor, and suffer together, always having before our eyes our commission and community in the work. We are members of the same body. So we must keep the unity of the body in the bond of peace. If we do, the Lord will be our God and will delight to dwell with us as his own people. And he will command a blessing upon us in all our ways so that we will see much more of his wisdom, power, goodness, and truth than we have ever known we will find that the God of Israel is among us. When ten of us will be able to resist a thousand of our enemies, and when he will make us a praise and glory that men will say of succeeding colonies, may the Lord make us like those of New England. For we must consider that we will be as a city on a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. So that if we deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken and cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we will be made a cautionary tale and a byword throughout the world. We will open the mouths of enemies to speak evil of the ways of God and all other Christians. We will shame the faces of many of God's worthy servants and cause their prayers to be turned into curses upon us till we are consumed out of the good land where we are going. Let us end this sermon with the exhortation of Moses. Moses, the faithful servant of the Lord in his last farewell to Israel, Deuteronomy 30. Beloved, there is now set before us life and death, good and evil. 
Here, we are commanded this day to love the Lord our God and to love one another. We are to walk in His ways and to keep His commandments and His ordinance and His laws and follow the points of our covenant with Him, so that we may live and be multiplied, and that the Lord our God may bless us in the land we are going to possess. But if our hearts turn away, so that we do not obey, but are seduced to worship other gods with our pleasure and profits, then it is declared from us this day forward, we will surely perish out of the good land that we are passing over this vast sea to possess. Therefore, let us choose life, that we and our children may live, by obeying His voice and clinging to Him, for He is our life and our prosperity. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. 